No fucking way. No way. Holy shit. Wow. 39. I was the here. You win, dude. Lunch is on me. Well, there's two people missing, too. They said I'm sick. Perfect, I can zoom in from here, yeah. Some of you are still working on it. That's fine. Right? 
So today is scheduled, okay? and uh, uh, I left the uh, recorded message and lecture of uh, cartoon noise and other stuff last week. All right, so today uh, I'll go through this a little bit, and, but I'll start with the uh, homework too. <laughs> so, homework two. Oh, excuse me. All right. Uh, this is regarding the homework one. Okay. And uh, there are a couple of questions about it. But let's say. <clears throat> Tinier uh, is there, and how many of you, how many of you have not have uh, not used the Tinier yet? Few of you. All right, so we give you a quick demo today. Okay. Okay. So when you use the uh, microwave or high speed equipment and so on, you need to calibrate it. All right. So we are using a very simple calibration here. Measure the unit step function with the right time. Attach something that you know, in this case, open. All right, so it's going to go from here to there. So in your case, voltage from here to there is approximately 2.25. And then, by taking a look at the voltage change, we just say this guy is a V1. So V1 over 0.25, which is an instant one, gives you the reflection coefficient at that point. Okay? So in this particular case, this is approximately one, which is a reflection coefficient of one. So calibration short, open, much impedance, you can check if the device is working properly and so on. And the one thing is a test board. <clears throat> Our board has three sections, 50, 100, and uh, 50 ohm here. Characteristics are shown there. So when you fabricate test board, let's go back. So these values, this is your design. Basically, you know the substrate, you specify the width of each section, then you calculate the expected tyrity constant, the effective tyrity constant. Right? So when you calculate, when you fabricate the PCB, you need to know the constraints. PCB fabrication process, uh, we use the chemical etching here. Accuracy of the chemical etching, basically, how far you can get it. Uh, this particular one is probably about 0.2 millimeter or so. We didn't ask the farmhouse to fabricate it. Right. So, which means this, the uh, width of, of the 100 ohm section. <coughs> It can be 1.56 or it can be 1.16. We don't know exactly, which is usually common. Now, in addition, when you are using a cheap substrate, such as FR, this particular one is fabricated on zero. So we know the direct constant, 2.3. Okay? Now, if you use FR4 type of substrate, we don't know the exact entire It's approximately four. It can be open four. Also, the material is not isotropic. 
which means <coughs> so here's the first law, right? Directed constant, if you measure this way, that gives you one value. If you measure sideways, it gives you another value and so on, which means it depends on the orientation of the subset. But we know approximately between 4 and 4.5 meter range. Right? So when you design the PCB, in many cases, right, so here is a test PC. Now, unlike this guy, all right, this is a 50 ohm section is, uh, what is the value? 4.75. Right? If you fabricate typical FR4 based PCB, 50 ohm section will fit about 0.5 millimeter or so. Now the accuracy of the fabrication process becomes more important. Right. So first you design the PCB. Then measure the impedance. How oh, accurately you design the PCB. Okay. <clears throat> and which means you measure, the measurement is done in time domain. You can do it in frequency domain. But time domain is much easier. So obtain the impedance of each section, then see how good it is. Okay. All right. We are already a little bit behind, right? so we are right there. Okay, today I should have assigned format three, but obviously I'm behind. Okay, so I need to come up with the device stage. Okay, now going back to format two. Nice stuff. It's up here. Okay. All right. That's fine. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, couple noise. Okay? 
So uh, what you're saying is few examples there. So the purpose of home activities, <laughs> you have a physical device. In this case, we have two transmission lines, okay? and located close to each other and so on. And uh, in practice, it's very difficult to see we have about 30 or so transmission lines running in there. Okay, which is a typical case when you're designing the digital systems and stuff. Okay. So the purpose of format to change, not the change, but start from start with the uh, physical device okay, and obtain an equivalent surface that you can do circuit simulations, spike simulations, and so on. Okay. Now, this process is known as parameter instruction. Right? You have a physical device. There is no inductor capacitor anywhere, but we are converting that into the model here. OK? So to create a model, First, you need to define how many unknowns you are dealing with. Okay? So in this particular case, we are dealing with six unknowns. These are characteristic, uh, <coughs> not characteristic, the uh, self capacitance of each line, mutual capacitance, self inductance, and the mutual inductance, and so on. Okay? Then by assuming we have two identical lines, which is this case here. Right. We can simplify the model, but we still have four unknowns. So <clears throat> C1G, C12, L11, and L12. Right. Now we want to obtain these values. Now there are different ways of getting those values, but the one you are using obtain those using the time domain data. Okay? So by using PDR, you measure the response. So in your case, we define this is port one, two, three, and four. So here's a back reaction, and here's the forward reaction. And signal comes in from there. Okay. So you can measure the reflection at port one. You can measure the backward coupled wave at port three and the forward coupled one at port four. So in your case, you are measuring the impedance of the coupled transmission line, which we call Z01. Okay. You can measure the velocity of the wave going through it. And also, you can measure the coupling coefficients, Kc and K. So now you have four equations and four okay. And now, from that, you can create an equivalent circuit. <clears throat> OK, the idea. Right. <clears throat> Now, the actual experiment, you don't need to do it. Okay. Once you become familiar with the TDR, that's enough. But if you want to do it, I'll set up one station for the uh, uh, couple of noise measure. Okay. Right, so, 
what we have is mm, we have a test board, I didn't bring it here, uh, of uh, different characteristics. Line length is the same here, but the spacing is changing. And the length is now uh, half of this kind, and also spacing is changing here and so on. And the data we have is coming from ABC. So this guy, this guy, and that one. So for each case, Uh, there was a question about the uh, time resolution. Only did you find out? No, yes. Okay. Uh, whether these values are accurate or not, okay. uh, we need to check it. But what we are seeing is <clears throat> basically this PCD, right? So the data first one is obviously backward couple signal. So unique set function for finite rise time signal goes in here. And what comes out from this pole shows something like this way. Okay. Now the second peak is due to the impedance attached at both two. Right? So Unique step, step, step function goes in, goes through the couple line that comes out. Something is attached <laughs> there. And ZL is attached there. <clears throat> And the data is observed at backward direction. Signal goes in here, right? So this data, what is attached? So, how do you know? Yeah, so how do you know show is that? Huh. Right. Second polarity is now positive instead of negative. Okay? Because for the coupled signal in this particular PCB, on this particular PCB, this is always positive. This guy should be negative. Okay? Because K, if you calculate KC and KL, right, and that gives you negative polarity. Okay? So, if you attach short, reflection coefficient is minus one, which means the polarity will be flip. Yeah. So basically, so this signal now becomes like this way, zero. And the one becomes minus. Right. It's not plus one becomes minus one, but anyway, it goes down. Let's say zero. Again. Sorry, this is not zero. What we are saying is the total voltage. 
So rise time becomes a four time, and uh, this four time gives you a positive forward couple noise. So the response becomes a like this. Okay, for this case. Right? So we have now if you attach open, you get a different value and so on. You can check what kind of excuse me. This one is a forward couple signal. So identify each case. Now, another case is uh, I was talking to Mori today and she said this value is magnitude wise is approximately 0.08. <coughs> okay. Now the magnitude of the previous one is 0.045. So if this guy comes first, value is 0 0.08 minus, this guy is plus 0 0.045 magnitude T value. Right? Okay, so the signal we see is this one is a forward coupled noise coming out from here directly. This guy is also a forward coupled noise, but the reflected <coughs> signal, the reflected step function is created. Alpha magnitude is divided. Yeah. I had a question previously. We have a square pulse. Should we expect two edges? If it's capacity coupling a square pulse, you expect one spike for first edge and a second spike for the second edge. Uh, you're looking on this input signal or here? Uh, what you're pointing at now. It's a square pulse, right? Yeah, this one is the bottom of the upper one. So, so it has two edges? Yeah, but this guy is not the input signal. Okay, the input signal is that? Yeah, input signal is just a unit step function with a finite rise. Hmm. Okay, but anyway, coming back to the question, uh, the question I asked you, how come magnitude is not the same? So, one of the minutes, um, the, minutes out, the, the forward coupled signal. Right, both of them are forward coupled. You, you can think of it as like a shift where the signal is being added in time forward versus the signal that's being added behind the signal that is it's cross but it's not red shift type of stuff it's here basically describing this problem uh yeah that also this project is happening and uh, yeah, you know, okay. said passes. Right. Both of his program and both of the PC is okay. Now, so loss. So FR4, let's say if I write the Upsilon R, 4 minus J, what is the typical value of FR4? Well, it's fairly large, depending on okay. So let's say 0 0.01. 0 0.01? 0 0.02 is probably better. No standard is uh, yeah, 0 0.02. So, hmm. If you write an equivalent story, of the 
transmission line Uh, in the case of lossless one, we ignore G and R. Okay? But if the uh, loss tangent becomes large, that G cannot be ignored anymore, okay? which means the transmission line becomes lossy. Right? Now, I'll go through a little bit, but when you introduce a loss on the transmission line, Loss will create this project. This project is created by two things here. Substrate loss will create this project. <coughs> and another one is Upsilon R is a function of frequency. Okay. In the case of FR4, right, the direct constant changes as a function of frequency. This 4 is actually a function of frequency. So the both of them will create a discord, which means what happens? The reflected guy is usually slightly wider in addition to the loss of the magnitude. Which is called this project. One question. So, would the area under that curve be equal to the other one if it's not lossy? Like, would it be spread out, but the area was still the same? Or is it. Uh, it yeah, amount of energy, if, if there is no loss. Okay. So, assume that R is zero and G is zero, but four is a function of frequency, and in that case, area under the sky is the same. You know, this Okay. All right. Okay, so first you estimate the KC and K. There are different ways of estimating it by using the peak of backward and the forward coupled voltages, that's one approach. And our approach is suited for the backward coupled one, but it may not be suited for forward coupled one. Another approach is you integrate over the uh, area, basically integrate over time, and from that, you can obtain KC and K. <laughs> if the input is a step function, and what we are getting at the ports, uh, at the coupled ports, um, is a passive coupling, so it's kind of like a high pass filter or the derivative, why, where do we get that wider square pulse from? The narrow spikes make sense as the derivative of the step function, but where does the wider square come oh. Okay, because of the uh, different time, the signal is arriving. Maybe I should go through the uh, lecture of the little bit here. So we are decomposing the couple signal into back and forward, right? And then if you take a look at the forward only, so the coupling, as you said, the coupling is occurring only from this uh, tangent region. So at this time, P1 coupling occurs, P2 slightly uh, delayed coupling occurs right here, and P3 and so on. But if you take a look at the total distance from here to there, all these cases are the same, right? So if you write time domain response, T1, T2, T3, all of them, they arrive at the same time. Okay? 
simply the distance. We are talking about distance from here to there, distance from here to there. Okay? Because coupling occurs only within this region. Okay, so which means they arrive at the same time and you get large P. Now, if you take a look at the macro and the coupled one, distance is not the same as you. Okay. So they are arriving at a different time. So what you see is simply a summation of these guys. And that will be spread. This time here. Okay, so the important thing is what we are showing here is backward couple signal is always there. Okay? For the couple signal, you can minimize it by using the sleep line transition. So, here is a multi layer PCB. It's about eight layers and so on. Okay? If you want to minimize the four couple noise, then lines should be embedded within the multi layer PCB. So, <coughs> But no matter what you do, the backward signal is always there. Why is that? Why, why is there that difference? The difference comes in the way <clears throat> uh, if you calculate the KC and the KF for two types of uh, transmission line. Microstream, you can show KC is not equal to K. Always. However, trans, uh, strip line transmission line, KC is always equal to K. So the way we are defined, we are based on this model, the way you put the value. Backward coupled one, excuse me, is the board coupled one, right? It's a different, it's proportional to the difference KC and, and difference between KC and K. So this car, if, this, if they're the same, it's basically zero. And <clears throat> backward coupled one, on the other hand, it's always non zero. So basically, so. If I could be right, you can kind of play around with the parameters on the lower ones to minimize that curve, pull out the other parameters, and then see how it's going to make it. So you can play with some of the. Which parameter? So just like when the first graph was 0.04, that was more spread out in times, it was a little bit more, it was less extreme. Jump. Right. And you can, by changing the actual parameters with the stripping, you can actually spread out that so that the peak gets smaller and smaller, and smaller, where you can't do that. Yeah. Which is true, but you know, to do so, you are inducing dispersion and potential loss and so on. That will create another problem. You can reduce the power carbon noise, but now you, have, you may be getting with the yeah. Dealing with the uh, uh, slow propagation time and so on, which is not a good approach. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the uh, <clears throat> now the question is exactly. Ah, uh, now, so what we are seeing is when we have microstrip, we have cosine dm, and the strip line, we have true dm. And whenever you have two key in case, case is always equal to here. 
level transmission that we are feeling. And I discussed how to obtain the capacitance. I didn't discuss how to obtain the inductance, but we can show that. But when you have a quasi PM, all right, so one is microstrip. So stru structure like this guy here. Or if you have a coplanar type of transmission line. It is also of course IPM, so you get the same kits. Okay, uh, the equivalent circuit just like already. So in terms of uh, lifetime characterization, <clears throat> the one we are using is a simple linear slope, but that doesn't give you the very nice quad couple noise. So the better approach, most likely square echo function that gives you a, maybe a triangular shape. You need to choose which ones to be for your particular application. So. Okay, now to estimate lamp element models. All right, so getting KC and KD is very straightforward. Now, the velocity measurement can be done by using the backward upper signal. Right. So if you are time delay is T that you can measure, and you know the length of the couple section, and from that, you can obtain the velocity, basically. All right, now, the other one is uh, you need impedance, and not the characteristic impedance of the coupled transmission line. Okay? Now, here is the impedance, characteristic impedance of line without anything around it, which is enough. If you put something close to the transmission line, that fixed impedance changes. Okay. So by measuring the reflection at this point, you can evaluate the characteristic impedance of the coupled section, which is the one. Now, value here, we are talking about the small change. So let's say what is about you. Uh, line A. Okay. So Reflection from the couple section is happening right there. This is a 50 ohm transmission line attached to it. So from here to there is, you can say, is basically up to this point. And then this small dip, this small dip. This section show, uh, is basically the couple transmission line section. We are seeing the reflection here. Okay. So the what you <clears throat> see is what well, this section impedance is 50 ohm, right? 
So what is this impedance? Is it greater or less? Less. Right? So it goes down. So the impedance is slightly less. And as you see, the reflection is pretty small. So we are talking about the value of uh, 45, 47, or in that range. We are not talking about huge amount. Okay. All right. So, uh, any questions about homework two? So, could you could you go back to that Excel sheet you just had with the the answers to the question? Uh, which one? The uh, one that we just had. So the reflection? Okay. Yeah, so, so I understand that middle part. Then what what then causes the dive on the on the second half? Like what causes the edge? Is that it hitting the, the low there? Oh you mean this part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she attached a short or something. Okay. Yeah. It's due to the uh, Something was attached at the end of that. Mm -hmm. So, so this the that transient theory is just that coupled part, right? Yeah. 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 So then, so I think that makes total sense. But then, I, I realize this is a very small time scale. But wouldn't that be more in the middle of the waveform instead of like that? That to me looks like three quarters of the way there instead of maybe even like a quarter of the way there. Okay, so that is something. You can get your own data. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> 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 so if you have questions and so on, you can already get your own data and see what This particular case, all right, we have a, a basically a game with extra game or something. Uh, oh, okay. So that's why you can see okay. So if you use your own data, you know everything. OK, any uh, questions? Yeah. Um, for the um, lecture that you recorded, because it looked like you're reviewing the notes from it, uh, yeah. could you post those um, markups on the canvas for that lecture? I did. It's not in uh, January 15th. I'm not taking this one. No? Did you on the preview of it? Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Next. Okay. Homework two is now. This <clears throat> one. Okay, uh, this one is a part two of uh, Brangent. Uh, previous lecture, recorded one, I skipped the dispersion. But the dispersion is something that uh, is important for these circuits and so on. Uh, so, briefly, Discuss about the dispersion. Now, there are different types of dispersion. 
One is called material dispersion. Okay. This basically the dielectric constant becomes a function of frequency. Right? So if we take a look at the transfer function of a signal going through the coaxial cable here. Okay. And we are changing frequency from F1 to F2. And the input signal magnitude of this signal is the same at all frequency. Then we assume it's zero degrees at all frequency, that's all. Okay. So if you put it in time domain, you get a very nice uh, pulse. All right. So if the dielectric constant is constant, basically epsilon is constant as a function of frequency. What comes out from this coaxial cable? You get exactly the same frequency response, magnitude-wise. Nothing changes, assuming we have a lossless transmission. Phase-wise, you have linear phase shift, okay? Because we have finite length. And the phase comes in as J minus JKZ. So the phase increases, I mean, decreases as a function of frequency. Now, in terms of time, you get exact shape. Right? Delta T here is still delta T, but arriving slightly less time because of the travel time from here to here, which makes sense, right? Now, this is basically a dispersion less case. Okay. Uh, here we are doing a material dispersion. Now, when we have a dispersion, now epsilon as a function of frequency changes. The important thing is magnitude of the transfer function doesn't change. You get exactly the same stuff. We are assuming the line is lossless. Right? Important thing is phase becomes nonlinear. This is the phase of transfer function and nonlinear. When you have a dispersionless line, the slope is linear. With dispersion, you don't have linear line anymore. Okay. If you take a free transform of this signal, what you see is the pulse arrives at the same time, but it will be stretched out. Okay. The stretching is due to the dispersion. The amount of energy within this shape is the same, so there is no loss space. So this is material dispersion. What we are seeing is velocity becomes a function of frequency. Okay. So these different at these different frequencies. The velocity of the wave propagating is not the same anymore. That's what we are seeing. Dispersion, of course, due to the loss of the <clears throat> due to loss on the PCB, such as FR4 case. Right. That's one thing we'll discuss. And another type of dispersion is called waveguide dispersion. Okay, I'll briefly explain it. Okay. And the other type is called mode dispersion. When you're dealing with optics and the targets. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'll, get in, get, I'll get into the lossy transmission again. In the case of waveguide, 
structure of the wave guide is the follow two, simplest one. It is propagating the follow two. Yeah. And uh, velocity within the wave guide is given by two types of velocity. One is called phase velocity, and the other one is called group velocity. Definition is uh, omega over theta for the phase velocity. Derivative of that stuff, d omega over d theta is a group velocity. Now, in the case of coaxial transmission line, okay, theta is omega times square root of LC, v1 and so so if you calculate these guys, you get the same value. Right? The velocity is one over square root of AC. So we don't distinguish the dots. Yeah. Now, of course, the interesting one is if you take a look at this data. Phase velocity is always greater than speed of light. Let's go. Alright, so this guy is a speed of light. Okay. Group velocity is always less than the speed of light. Now, this definition. I added this lecture note This is called a guided wave Details may uh, not be so important but the concept is important okay. So when we have a wave guide Basically, we have two metallic print. So when you create transmission line, by using two metallic print, similar to uh, microsafe transmission line. And if you take a look at from the side, there are two different ways that the wave can propagate. I'm showing the direction of the electric field. So the electric field is from top to bottom or bottom to top, and the propagating in the horizontal direction. That's one. And this will create either transverse electromagnetic wave or quasi TM. That's what we're dealing with. Another one is wave can be bounced between those two phases. This is called either PE or TM waves, transverse electric or transverse magnetic, depending on the orientation of the E field, right? So, wave goes up, deflected, comes down, deflected, and so on. Now, if you take a look at that behavior, wave can be deflected at small angle or a large angle and at some point wave is simply moving up and down here. Okay. So when wave is moving up and down, no energy or no wave is propagating in that direction. And this is called the evanescent wave. And so below the certain frequency, nothing goes through this structure. So the way we define the velocity so we have a bouncing wave okay. 
So within the length of delta L, we have one wavelength. Right, so this is the one wavelength. And uh, as you see here, this point is zero degree, that point is 360 degrees, which is also zero degree. Okay. Now, if you project that one wave on this horizontal plate, right? So just projecting this way, you get delta L from it. Now, if you project, assuming uh, this uh, transverse to the direction of propagation, you get here, you get there. And notice that L, uh, delta L prime is much, not much. Delta L prime is longer than delta L. De I mean, the double prime. Delta L prime is shorter than delta L. Okay. So if you define the velocity, actual velocity of the wave is a delta L over delta T, which is theta. But if you define the velocity as delta L prime over delta T, so this becomes less than C now. Now, if you define the velocity as delta W prime over delta D, it becomes greater than C now. So, okay. so this is called the phase velocity, how the phase changes along the line. And the other one is called group velocity. And this group velocity is fairly close to energy velocity. not quite the same. But by taking a look at the group velocity, you can find the energy velocity. <clears throat> okay, so, when you are dealing with the guided wave, dispersion due to the guide, uh, the wave by the ability, <clears throat> dispersion due to the guiding structure becomes very important. This will be a dominant Dispersion like this. Okay. That's what you need. Uh, Mole dispersion is very similar. So, if you take a look at the multi mode optical fiber, basically the light is bouncing within two meters to some extent. Similar. So, we can immediately see that this angle can be different. So which means multi-mode structure, you can support many bouncing waves and so on. Okay. Now, so lossy PCE, such as FR4, right? mm -hmm. loss comes in two ways. One is copper loss, and the other one is conductor loss. So this guy is a kappa loss. And conductor loss. Excuse me. Uh, Substrate. Uh, typically, if the uh, line is short, you can ignore a couple loss. Uh, substrate loss depends on the loss tangent of uh, <coughs> the substrate. Now, you are designing. On the silicon wheel. Okay. So you are creating transmission line. This line is a top silicon. Uh, 
Assume that the substrate is on the, I mean, the line, transmission line is on the silicon dioxide. This time to the top silicon transmission line. What is your transmission line model? You are creating a microwave circuit on silicon vehicle. And transmission line on that cover, you are using top silicon to create good conductivity. What model can we use? First of all, silicon dioxide. What is it? Is it good directly or lossy directly? Silicon dioxide is a very good directly. It's not lossy at all. Okay? So if you fabricate line on silicon dioxide, you can pretty really ignore the loss. Which means this guy you can neglect. Dope silicon. What is the conductivity of dope silicon? Which is true, not very high. Okay? Then what do you do with this guy? Well, yeah, but we want to simplify. So in the case of dope silicon, inductance is not important. Right? So now you have a transmission line, your model of the transmission line is this. Okay. So depending on the structure of what materials you are using, you need to change the <clears throat> transmission line model. Lossless transmission line, we assume the R is zero, G is zero, and so on, which is good enough for coaxial transmission line and so on. Silicon, you have R, C, R, C, and so on. Okay. Now, once you get that model, then you need to calculate the propagation constant, how it goes. Actually, we have gamma complex propagation constant. We have alpha plus J beta. Now you can show that alpha is a, gives you exponential decay, which is loss, right? So in the case of dope silicon, alpha is fairly large, and so if you calculate it, okay. Anyway, so loss comes in either from the transmission line itself or substrate. Okay. And Important thing is, if you have complex impedance for Z and Y, right, propagation constant becomes complex. You have now alpha and beta here. Okay? Now the important thing is, while alpha itself gives you attenuation, beta, okay, <clears throat> So, if lossless case, beta is simply omega times square root of LC. But now with the loss, beta becomes complicated, and that will create <coughs> right here. Now beta contains R and G, and velocity, you can show the velocity, which is omega over beta, contains omega naught, basically, which means velocity changes as a function of frequency. Okay? So, this is called the uh, material dispersion. 
Now, Berowski, few things we define here. Berowski, if you take a look at this, Velocity is always a real function. Right? Velocity doesn't become complex. However, impedance becomes complex. <clears throat> So transmission line, if you put, now we are writing this as Z and Y. Okay. So square root of Z or Y, and if you put that, it becomes complex, and we can write it, let's say, for the R0 plus KX0. It's a characteristic impedance. Yeah. Now, if you have a capacitor, we know impedance is 1 over J omega C. Right? It's imaginary. When you have a capacitor, does it create a loss? It doesn't. Energy is simply stored in a capacitor. Right? So, impedance is imaginary. Okay? Now, the characteristic impedance, as you see here, it becomes complex. So, we can write it as R0 plus Jx0. That imaginary part, what does it show? Does it show that some energy is stored in transmission line? Lossless transmission line means what? R0 is 0 or X0 is 0 when we say lossless transmission. I'll not be zero. Capacitor, lossless impedance is imaginary. You can show the same thing with the inductance. So in the case of transmission line, okay? Lossless transmission R not is zero or X not is zero. R not is zero. Do you agree? I have RG fifty eight. Impedance we know is approximately fifty ohm. So what you're saying is, if I use the RG58 and if I get lossless transmission line, that guy becomes zero. No, right? So in the case of transmission line, real part shows the propagation characteristics. That impedance is always non-zero. <laughs> Imaginary part shows you the loss on the transmission. Okay. So if you create a lossy transmission line, the characteristic impedance becomes complex and the imaginary part becomes large. Okay? So the characteristic impedance can be complex. 
but velocity is always here. Okay, now, uh, so in the case of velocity transmission line, if you send the fast rise time signal due to the dispersion, okay, you get stretched out rise time and so on. And you can go through the model. You can write the transmission line model in terms of Laplace transform and obtain the solution for different cases and so on. It's it's not the main problem. Okay. Um, so uh, back to the, the complex part being the, the lossy part. How is the lossiness and the spreading out of that caused by reflections in the line? Whereas if there is no phase, it would just go straight through. Is that uh, reflection is caused by an impedance mismatch. So it's uh, if uh, all line, you know, it's a uniform line, this guy, and everywhere is lossy, there is no discontinuity. So the reflection doesn't happen. Yeah. So actually, uh, can we find the phase velocity is equal to one over the square root of the permeative again times the permeative again? All right. So when the material is lossy, which means the, uh, for example, the permeative becomes complex, right? Right. But why is the phase velocity still, uh, you said it's still real? Oh, when we define the velocity, we always take real part of the sky. Okay. And uh, I don't know the uh, concept of complex number polyphenols. Okay. Why don't we take a short break and then continue? Yeah, no problem. And then I'll make the 
I checked out. I just went into acoustics, man. I'm, like, <laughs> well, I'm trying to. I was trying to develop an application for some of this. The the, the signal intelligence, like just be able to put in all the data, yeah, import it in, yeah. and be able to see it. You can actually see the wave, but I just want to be able to calculate it. It'd be yeah, it makes sense. For me, I'm actually glad that I asked the question on like the squiggly line, right? Because like I would have not like just looking at the data, I wouldn't be able to figure. You're out talking about that one where he had the short at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like, why was it like the three quarters the at the end. I wouldn't. Have, like, well, he just he just said you to get, said you to get your own data, right? Yeah. Did he give an answer? Well, no. Like it, it's because of the that test setup, the input line was much longer. Oh, like, that's why it looks like right. it, you would assume that it would be in the beginning of that wave. That's it comes up. That's right. But okay. Because of the test setup. That's Is it the why. second cable's longer? Is that what he said? He said that like going into that first point, that was the longer cable. Oh. So, well, that's why it looked like it was out here. Exactly right. Okay. Good it's question. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, he's going to do the uh, yeah. demo here, right? Yeah, yeah.
Separation is lambda over O. Everything is defined in terms of wavelength. Okay? So there are two holes. So this we call two holes up here. Hole one and hole two. Okay? So wave comes in, part of this goes out, and goes in the forward direction and the backward direction. And this guy comes out from here in the forward direction and the backward direction. Now immediately you see that these two components, they are in phase. So the signal becomes larger. So if you create more hole, you can get more coupling and so on. Separation is always lambda over two. Now if you take a look at these two guys, they are out of phase. You cancel. And this becomes basically zero. Right? So if you create a structure, like a waveguide, two waveguides on top of each other. And if you send in the signal from here, desired one comes out in that direction. Okay. This is called co-direction path. <coughs> Now, on the other hand, if you create the device using two microstrip transmission lines like this, right? And this pole is through, usually it is terminated with a much impedance. Okay. The important thing is, in the case of microstrip direction and transmission line based direction and coupler, desired signal comes out in the back direction. And in the forward direction, it's usually terminated with the maximum delays. This is called a counter directional. So oh, it's actually yeah, counter directional, co directional, and so on. Yeah. So it's important to understand that which way the desired signal comes up. Right. As you see here, two ports must be terminated with the maximum impedance. Otherwise, the device doesn't work. If you put open here, the device doesn't work on so. Question is, which port do you turn it? That depends on the type of structure you have. And the mathematical description of uh, how it works is shown here. Uh, this is called couple of theory and so on. And after the analysis of couple nine is shown there, uh, probably we don't have time to go through it, but mm. this is one of the device, microwave device. So the point is, Coupling is not always bad. Okay. You can make a nice device by using that phenomenon. All right, now, uh, let's take a look at this guy. OK, so we are still working on the, um, we are still studying the time domain phenomena.
Okay. Here we are dealing with the uh, parameter extraction. We have already done it, okay? just going through a few things. Now, when you do the uh, parameter extraction in time domain, we use TDR. Even in the case of experimental approach, we use TDR, which is basically homework one, homework two. So once you go through that, you can you become familiar with it. Now, if you want to simulate a time domain phenomena, numerical approach quite often we use FDD, time difference, finite difference time domain. So, now, if you can do it in time domain, you can also do the same thing in frequency domain. Right? So in the frequency domain, a uh, numerical approach, we are, we are solving electromagnetic problem in frequency domain. And the uh, <coughs> type of packages we use is finite element and the method of moment and so forth. Particular package we use the HFSS, it's a part of ED, and you'll be using it in homework 3, 4, and the uh, final okay. Experimental approach, you are using network analyzer to get the data. Okay. So it's simply a different approach, different techniques. And so. so let's take a look at parameter instruction. <clears throat> Parameter extraction is needed whenever you are dealing with some sort of discontinuity. Suppose you are creating, uh, you are routing the transmission line, and you have sharp edge. And that sharp edge, you are basically creating large amount of charge distribution. Okay? Basically, you have elastic admittance. The parasitic admittance should be eliminated. One approach to do so is cut the cord. Now, equivalent circuit of parasitic admittance is usually either pi or p. We are already familiar with the pi or t in this case. All right, so if you want to model it, you write the master index and the master. The important thing is there is no dimension. You have dumped element model of that physical section. Okay? Now, the other one is a p, so we have capacitor and inductor and so on. Now, in the case of sharp corner, I said the extra charge is created. Which one is dominant one? Inductor or capacitor? Capacitor. Obviously, capacitor. Okay. So, simplest model is ignore inductance and use just capacitor to create that stuff. Now, if you have a VR, VR is. Mm. Oh, I, uh, mm. If you are not familiar with VR, you can take a look at your computer. VR is basically connecting multimedia PCBs. Okay. Uh, there are a bunch of tiny holes connected to it. Uh, I have a picture. So you have a multi-layer PCB with the ground, power, and the so on. So if you want to route one transmission line from the top to the bottom, you create a conducting, you create a hole, and fill it with the conducting material. Okay. 
So now you know more than me. Let's say you have 50 ohm transmission line, nice one, 50 ohm transmission line, right? corresponding ground and so on. VR doesn't have that. Okay. Although the distance is very small, we are talking about a few meters and so on. And that gives you extra inductor. I mean, usually we just use the inductors, not the bystanders and so on. So this is a model of the VR and so on. Now, if you change the dimension, now you have a step. Uh, we had a PCB. 50 ohm line, 50 ohm line, and the ohm, and this length is 20 millimeter. Okay? So we have impedance step. We don't know these, uh, we don't know lines are changing, right? So that's what we have. Now we have extra admittance due to this step, and we can moderate either P or I and so on. Now, what is the effect of the discontinuity? 100 millimeter is the physical length. Right? You can say measure. Now, if you put it into the model using transmission line model, this is the 50 ohm, 100 ohm, 50 ohm. Length of this section, and their own section. Right. It's not an ideal transmission line anymore. We have this step. Does it become effective? I'm talking about effective. Does it become shorter or longer? Longer. Longer? Are you talking about the 50 to 150 there? Yeah, this center section. Right, so it becomes shorter or longer? Right? And we are putting this into an equivalent length. Right? Does it become shorter or longer? Longer. Okay. Okay. Now, what about the length of this section? Length of this section. 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 Do you need to make this longer or short? Longer? I would say longer. Yeah. What is the reason that longer? Uh, noise, uh, quantization errors of your, of your measurement uh, tools and techniques. Um, yeah. I'm sure he's looking. What is the effect of the capacitor? If this guy, right? Let's go up to a very simple example. Suppose I have transmission line with open. There is no perfect code. Okay? So I can write this guy equivalent circuit is transmission line with the length L here. Transmission line, the length L here, Z now, and I attach a capacitor, C. Open-ended transmission line, there is no perfect open, so open-ended transmission line, the end load condition is basically open. Right. Now, what is the equivalent model of this line? Z naught, perfect open. And then, L prime. This L prime, is it the same as L? 
or shorter than L or longer than L. L prime. Shorter or longer? Is that short? Did you read what is the reason? Because you're looking at the, the sign and the angle that the wave bounces as it happens. Okay, uh, that's not quite. It's more. Okay. No other solution? Okay, it's alright. What it does it makes transmission line effectively longer. Okay? You can replace this guy by a piece of transmission line, right? Whenever you have plastic admittance, such as capacitance and so on, Effective length increases to take care of the stuff. And uh, what is the way now we're saying? Piece of, all right, so to some extent you can do that. We'll do this term. Okay? You calculate the input impedance of the transmission line. Z. Right. Now that the input impedance is a function of a load attached and also the length of the transmission line. So, and that the input impedance can be either inductive or capacitive, depending on the length of the section and the load function. So we'll do this. Right? So I'm just giving you an idea. And you can show that if you have open and uh, length is short, input impedance is basically a capacity. So what you're attaching here, you can replace this guy by a short transmission. We'll, we'll do it. All right. So coming back to this, if you have a step, I mean, in this case, two steps. Each one is giving you extra capacitance, admittance, basically. That effect is effective length of this section becomes long. Okay. We'll do, we'll do the, uh, the details. So, just to clarify, like so, what since it makes it seem longer, would we have to make it shorter to then match the characteristics of your Now, that part becomes important when you do the homework for <clears throat> homework for I'm not sure if I put it there. Okay. Okay, what well, uh let's see okay, now. Uh, this is not what you're doing here, okay? Uh, homework four is basically you are designing Ninety degree hybrid. This is a hybrid. So this is a design you are simulating and so on. And the hybrid is designed in terms of wavelength. Okay. This is a typical hybrid. We go through the details later. Okay. Section. Each section has a lambda over four of length. Right. So it's a lambda over four, lambda over four, lambda over four, and so on. Now, this is the ideal transmission line model. And if you design it at a few gigahertz, obviously ideal transmission line model doesn't work. Okay? You need to adjust the net. The device you are designing is this kind, not that one. This one. It's the same characteristics, but it's a different design and easier to implement. 
Notice that you have P section here, P section here, P section here and there. So if you use lambda over four from here to there, same thing lambda over four, device doesn't work. And the reason is this P section gives you extra admittance. That extra admittance must be eliminated. The only way to eliminate is to reduce the length. So the extra admittance, how to evaluate and so on, becomes very important when you implement the microwave circuit. Now you are dealing with non-ID transmission. That's what you need. Doing data, right? Okay. <clears throat> so parameter extraction techniques, and you are familiar with the uh, time domain already. So this is a via in time domain. This particular case, signal goes from layer two to six, and uh, then comes up to and comes up, up and down to and so on. There are a bunch of via. So if you take a look at transmission characteristics, basically the measurement is done with all these lines. We have a bunch of gears. Okay. And it shows the deflection and the transmission characteristics. This is the deflection. Each dip is due to B. Line is designed for 50 ohm. Now, so this is a 50 ohm now. Signal is slightly higher, as you see here. This section, the transmission line section. Basically, this section is a transmission line section here. Now, if you obtain the reflection characteristic like this one, what can you tell about the transmission line? Uh, what do you mean that? Uh, this continuity is coming from the via, basically. We don't know where, yeah, via is the inductive uh, so. But here I'm talking about transmission line itself. Okay? You are measuring the reflection from this structure. Right? Deflection comes from the via and also transmission line. Okay? Length of this car is much longer than via size and so. So what can you tell from this thing? Yeah. Uh, since the reflections have a negative sign, it's the lower impedance at that at the point of the reflection. Uh, this is 50 ohm. Right, it's where the reflection is, it's a negative going reflection. This is negative going or positive going? Your point is fine, but is it positive or negative? I was saying about the, the, the small dips. Oh, that's a beer. That's yeah. a beer. Okay. You have a good point, right? When you fabricate PCB, okay, you are trying to match the impedance, which is 50 ohm. But you may not get the exact 50 ohm. So what this shows is design transmission line, layer 2 and layer 6, which is not 50 ohm. Slightly higher than 50 ohm. Right. So now you have reflection coming here, reflection basically. So actually, via impedance is closer to 50 ohm. Reflection becomes less. Mm -hmm. okay. So you design the PCB for particular impedance that doesn't mean you have exactly the design impedance. It depends on the structure and so on. Only way to tell is just measure. 
Okay. Okay, now, uh, all right, so we are done with the time domain. So let's take a look at the little bit of frequency domain approach. <clears throat> now, when you are characterizing a device, uh, for example, with chips and devices and so on, Quite often you need to put it on the PCB, right? And you attach a connector, and you have a chip itself. Okay, so you can say this is a test PCB. And you want to obtain the characteristics of this device. That's what you want. But what you can measure is only from here to there. Right? So in terms of the circuit. From here to there gives you S prime. That's what you need. What you want is S. And you can write each one in terms of S parameters. You see here. Right? S prime is what you measure, and S is what you want. Now, assuming the line is lossless, And then by relating those, lossless transmission line gives you extra phase shift, basically. And if you go through it, you can actually write the desired S in terms of line phase shift and what you measure. Okay. And this technique is called the embedding technique, simplest one. Okay. <clears throat> If you take a look at the key site or a giant website and so on, you can find a bunch of references about the embedding techniques. And so, on. Okay. so this is the simplest approach of the embedding. Now, if you have a lossy transmission line, now obviously you need to modify the, uh, the approach slightly, but similar technique can be. Cascaded network. The systems we deal with, it doesn't have just one component. It has a bunch of components attached in series, usually. So you have bypass filter, amplifier, matching circuit, amplifier, and so on. And usually when you design these things, you characterize each component. Right, so you have S parameters of high bus filter, amplifier S, maximum, and so on. Okay. Now the question is, what is the total response of this system? That's what we want when we design this system. Can we take a product of S parameters to obtain the total response? The reason, I mean, the answer is no. You cannot do it. Now, the reason is when you take a look at S parameters, you have uh, left hand side, you have, let me just go back to definition of the S parameters. We have A1, B1. Uh, maybe I can this way. A2 and B2. Okay. So definition of S parameters is left hand side we have B1 and B2. B1 is the input and B2 is the output. Right? Now, here we have A1 and A2. A2 is the output side, and so on. Okay? Now, whenever you have a definition like this guy, take a look at the Z parameters. You write the Z parameters, 
and you have V1, V2, Z, I1, and I2. Look, it's the same thing. Left hand side, you have voltage one, which is input, voltage two, which is output. Okay? So, whenever you have parameter, Z, Y, S, and so on, which contains input and output on this side, you cannot cascade the system. Okay. So, here what we are doing is Let's say you have a simple key network given by Z1, Z2, and Z3. We are simply trying to express the key network using different parameters. Either S, Z, Y, doesn't matter. We are still dealing with the same thing. Okay. So which means we can change the parameter. So instead of using Z, suppose if you put V1 and I1 on this side, which is now input on the V2 and I2 on the output side. Okay. Now obviously we cannot use Z parameter anymore, so we write it in terms of ABC. Now, if you put two of them together, so A, B, C, D, 1, and A, B, C, D, 2. And if you obtain the output, now this becomes the input of the second stage and so on. All right? And if you express input and output, you basically get the product of two ABCD parameters. Okay. So which means if we have a cascading system, right, what we need to do is express each one in terms of ABCD okay, and then take a product and obtain the total ABCD. Then convert this back to S. Back to S. Now, why do we need to convert back to S? Let me ask you this. When you are dealing with the Z parameters, right, you have Z11, Z12, Z21, and Z22. Two-port network. Take a look at this key. What is Z11? Z11 is defined as equal V1 over I1 when I2 equals 0. Right? That's the definition of the Z11. Okay? So what is the value of Z11? Output current is 0. What does it mean? What is the meaning of I2 equals zero? Yeah, output open. When you have output open, and if you take a look at the input impedance, what is the impedance? G1 plus D2, right? So immediately we can see, all right, this guy is simply G1 plus D2. And you can obtain the rest of the stuff. Okay. Which means you can identify these parameters in terms of either physical system, how the system works, and so on. It's very easy to understand. 
Now, you can define anything. Now you define in terms of ABCD. The question is, what is the meaning of these ABCD? Right. Some of them are related to impedance. Some of them are related to whatever it is. But difficult to understand the physical meaning of all these parameters. So, you can obtain the total response in terms of ABCD. Instead of trying to understand what is going on, you go back to something that you can understand, which is s So ABCD is a simply mathematical convenience you are dealing with. Okay, now ABCD is very important. Uh, let's go back. Soon we'll be taking a look at. I will give this thing, so take a look at this guy. You are designing a hybrid. Hmm. Uh, this next channel, we go through this data. Okay? Hybrid is a 4-4 uh, four -four device. It has for 1, 2, 3, 4. So instead of dealing with 4-4 four -four device, we cut it into half. Right? So if you cut it into half, it becomes two-fold. Right? One, two, two, or three, two, four, one, so on. Okay? To cut it into half, we impose the boundary condition. If the center point is open or short, and this technique is called even and old modernized. We go through the details of this. But the important thing I'm describing if you cut it into the half, right? So now we have transmission line, something attached in parallel, transmission line, something <coughs> attached in parallel, and then transmission line. What we get is a cascading transmission line. Right? So once we understand what is going on, it's a cascading system. You use ABCD. Shunt gives you ABCD. Piece of transmission line gives you ABCD. Last one also gives you ABCD. So once you get the total response, and then go back to S parameters to obtain the response of the system. Okay? So ABCD is extensively used for analyzing microwave circuit. This is something that you need to become familiar with. Okay, so once you get the ABCD, there are simple formulas to get S parameters back. Right? And uh, uh, this is a conversion table. 
from uh, S to Z, uh, S to A, B, C, D, and other stuff. Okay, now another application of A, B, C, D. Later on, you'll be characterizing the material. You want to obtain the directly constant by measuring the transmission or reflection. Now, in many cases, We need to put material within the some sort of container. So if you are dealing with the powder and so on, now the material is basically contained in a glass plate, material and glass plate. Okay? So top one, you can write it by using simple transmission line model. Second one, now you have a cascading transmission type. Given by Z1, Z2, and Z1. Okay. Material properties included in Z2. And so the model you are creating is ABC model. <laughs> okay, so we use it extensively. Now, ABCD is defined by using total voltage and total current. V1 and V2, they are total voltage. I1 and I2, total voltage and total current. So when we define S parameters, S parameters are defined in terms of incident and the reflected voltage. E1, A to incident, and E1, B to reflected, right? So this is the definition. So instead of writing B1, B2 here, if you write B1 and A1, and A2 and B2, now you have input on the left side, and output right there. Now immediately you see that, okay? If you write this way, then you can simply cascade T parameters. If you have two T parameters, total response is simply a product of those two parameters. So this is another approach. Now, similar to ABCD, once you get T, you need to go back to S. The reason is, what is the meaning of T? You can write T11 is B1 over A2 when B2 is zero. What does it mean? Okay. T1 to T1 is a B1 over B2 and A2 equals zero, <coughs> 0 and so on. A2 equals 0 makes sense. Output is as a much for B2 equals 0, what does it mean? So instead of using T to understand what is going on, you need to go back to S to understand. Okay, uh, this part is a detail, so we can skip it here. <clears throat> All right, here's the unmatched transmission. Okay. Uh, impedance is different, in this case, 144, but you took a look at the response in the uh, handling. Here you are taking a look at the, same, uh, the response in the frequency domain. Okay. Oh. 
All right, so once you create a model, you do simulations. This discontinuity gives you the extra admittance. Right? So here is the extra admittance and so on. Now, if you express it in terms of T parameters, not T parameters, T junction, okay, we want to obtain the value of the inductance and the bastards. Here we are talking about parameter extraction in frequency. Okay, so first you do the simulation using ideal transmission. So this is the response you get. And the frequency response of this ideal transmission line, frequency response S11, V1, and so on. Now, next you do the simulation. This is based on the numerical simulation, not the experiment. Using EM model. HFSS is basically solving the electromagnetic problem. Yeah. And you'll be using it later on. Okay. So this HFSS, high frequency structure simulator, yeah, high frequency structure simulator, gives you the very accurate data. So this is the S parameter obtained from HFSS. Now, if you compare those two, ID and numerical simulations, you can identify the difference. Difference is very small. Uh, which line is which? I don't know which one is which. Um, okay, blue one is ideal. And uh, this guy is a HFSS. Right. So what you're seeing is S11, S12, and S2. Now, it's a little bit difficult to see, but at the low frequency, agreement between the ID and the HF is, is, is pretty good. But as frequency increases, the agreement becomes less and less and so on. We see actually quite a bit of difference between those. Right? Now, Once you get the numerical data, okay, you are trying to model the transmission line by using some sort of plastic parameters. Okay. And the model you are trying to extract is T, T junction, basically. And uh, inductance, capacitance, and inductance. And most likely, inductance is not that important. And so on. Okay. How do you obtain the value of these guys? What can you do? Right? You have ideal transmission line model, numerical results, which we assume is accurate. And we want to obtain the values of these guys. Assume that it's simply C. What can we do? What approach is needed?
What is the simplest approach? No. Would the reduction coefficient at the step be different than what you would expect due to the extra capacitance? And you could maybe calculate it that way? Which is basically this less one minus the reflection coefficient. We are talking about as a function of energy. In time domain, notice that in time domain, you can get reflection coefficient very easily at a given this quantity. You can obtain the impedance value from the reflection coefficient as well. In time domain. In frequency domain, you see everything together. Right? A bunch of things. All the information is still there, but it's not in between. So what is the simplest approach when you have that kind of Well, yeah, that's true, we are doing it. But basically you simply assume certain value, right, of C, and calculate a bunch of cases. See which one gives you the best B. So I have a question. Can you go back to the graphs there? Sure. So when a frequency is like that, could you also correlate that with the root velocity? Like there is that cutoff where you wouldn't actually get any throughput. Could you try to calculate the group velocity and then back out to see one of us where to see? Okay, let's go back to the line. If you write it, in terms of length here, in terms of lambda. Wave length. Okay? L is actual length, but we are writing it in terms of wave length. Let's say L is uh, lambda over A, L is lambda over 4, L is lambda over 2, L is lambda. Okay. In what case do we expect to see the perfect transmission? Basically, if we take a look at S12, at that frequency, S12, S21, same thing here, is 1, 0 dB, which means we have perfect transmission. We have perfect transmission here, perfect transmission here, and so on. So the question is, that frequency corresponds to what? Effective length we can find. When the effective length of the section becomes one of these, we get no reflection, perfect transmission. What value and then should be half a right? Okay. So it's actually these three. Every time it's round by one. Okay. If the length becomes lambda over two, you can show, we'll do it later, you can show the reflection coefficient becomes zero. So what you are seeing in this data is basically that lambda over 2 is happening periodically. That's what it is. So when the transmission is 1, obviously reflection becomes very small. Ideally, it should be 0. OK, so simplest one, optimization technique. You are doing basically optimization. Right? Assume certain value. Put that into your model and calculate. Right? Your model is ABCD basically. Right? So you have a capacitor and you are trying to figure out the value of that guy 
Now you have ABCD model. So you write ABCD parameters, create a total response, and convert it into the frequency S parameters. Compare that S parameter with a simulated one. If the value is defined, adjust C and so on. Usually, you need to use a better optimization technique. One is evaluate uh, the amount of error along the frequency and then minimize it, this square type of approach. You can see my text. So. Okay, so frequency domain data is very useful, very accurate, but it may not be so intuitive to see. So we would be optimizing, so we would do an experimental data collection that we would be optimizing the difference between the model and right. put that C as kind of the right. okay. The coverings, all right, you can measure, you know, you attach an SMA connector here, and you attach an SMA connector here. And by using the network analyzer, you measure the transmission characteristics and so on. That can be done. Right? Easily done. Okay? The trouble is, in frequency domain, what you see is everything. Right? At each frequency, so if you take a look at uh, at a given frequency, your reflection is coming from everywhere. In time domain, you can easily see which one is which and so on. So, frequency domain data with connectors attached and you can get it, but that doesn't mean it will give you a good information. <clears throat> okay, so this can be done. So the ABCD is very useful. Uh, in the case of uh, BIA, usually model is a uh, uh, inductor. You may need to put the uh, bus and other stuff and so on. And uh, uh, this shows the response of the VI uh, in time domain with unit cell function. So okay, uh, let me just get it. Okay. Okay, so this person I discussed and the parameter extraction couple noise I discussed and so on. Right. So the last item I need to do is a demo of uh, PDR. Okay. But
<laughs> Homework three is on the website already. Okay. Now, some of you took my antenna class last year. And uh, this is very easy for you guys. Okay. And basically, homework three is to become familiar with the uh, E. And the impedance matching is not done. The, uh, what you are simulating is the Armax impedance section, PCB, and so on. Okay? So, uh, you know, if you're already familiar with ED, read stuff, and we'll give you the tutorial. And I'm adding tutorial to the website. Now, as I said, homework four, five, six, wait, I give six, and also final project, you are using ED extensive to design the okay. And you need to become familiar with it. You can do two things with ED. One is circuit simulations, the other one is EM simulation. And you need to become familiar with both of them. Okay, because final project you are doing both of them. Okay. How, do we, how do we access that? Is that um... It's on the uh, E server. All right. Uh, okay, I need to yeah, I need to show you how to access it. Okay. Uh, the remaining thirty minutes or so is a demonstration of video. If you have not done it, okay. So would you stay with me and uh, become familiar with the video? Yeah, we just uh, also I got a question about the uh, the corner examples. Yeah. Uh, when you have a sharp corner, right. that causes more capacity. Because of the extra charge, yeah. it electric field becomes tight. So when you cut it off, that's yeah. essentially lowering that speed. Right. Right. Yeah. Why would you go to more curve? Could we leave him? Oh, I can't see it. I, I zoomed in on it, yeah. So I don't actually want to uh, 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 yeah, I, I may I may move down a seat so I can zoom in, so I can just upload it for everybody. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. Well, actually, uh, this one gives you a better characteristic, but you know. If you have a sharp corner, you, usually this kind of this task is uh, added to many, many elements. And uh, adjusting the end from here to there, from here to there, and so on, it's much easier if you have this sharp corner right here instead of the corner. But yeah, it's a lot easier to play with the. Because if you design the hybrid and so on, right, you are dealing with the transmission line going this way, that way, and so on. Everything must be good. So, what, what's the impact? Look at that one. Oh, man. Oh, come on, right? Let me see your head, buddy. Sorry, you can reduce the. Uh... No, 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 uh, I 
Okay, so it's a uh, senior ready. Yeah. Okay, so if you are not familiar with the senior, make sure to get yeah. it. Okay. You don't need to get your own data, but make sure to become familiar with the data. And by the way, guys, I'll, I'll record this and upload it to YouTube so if you guys want to watch it later. And just bite them in. Take a look. I record everything. <laughs> I'm not the government. Eyeballs, eyeballs. I'll just help for it. I don't have the best memory. So. Yeah, appreciate that. Is there any way I can switch seats with it? Uh, yeah, I'm going to even. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'm, I'm going to move down. Yeah, it's okay. Sometimes there will be some error message, but uh, just ignore it and post. So actually, right now you can see from here if the red light is on, it means the uh, the signal is sent out from the this channel. So basically, that's the uh, channel, and uh, you can basically see the there's a the input pulse the signal and there's a loss of That's because yeah. it's over. So, Next the is one effect one of the is uh, you will get a loss of uh, uh, and choose an original signal. <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah, this is open right now. Because you can attach anything here. Yeah, it's just, uh, just a blank uh, estimate cable. Uh, what's the current What's what? What's the current stamp? Oh, so that's the one. <laughs> Okay, okay. It should sweep in the voltage out like this. We use these a lot in the military for cable testing on airplanes. It's like 10 hours a day, man. Constant 30 day inspections, 90 day inspections. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, it's so a it's pain, in the, pain in the neck, but uh, it's necessary. The shooting, low, shooting, low, shooting, low, and all that. Yeah, so absolutely. I think there's some that the thing. Using I'm assuming some sort of interval inspection on an airplane. Yeah, it's mandatory. Check check to make sure the wiring is still not bad so well i mean you got a 200 million dollar system yeah so if you have one conductor on a transit line it's like corroded shorted whatever yeah that's a problem are those on airplane do they get all the captain wiring out of the airplanes or do they still have captain uh, wiring or stuff they have sleep yeah so mm, none of the stuff that i've worked on okay yeah. i know for a while they're getting rid of all of it because that's yeah, all the part issues mm -hmm. so these lines here it, it is, it's that's like, just just the gun and that's just like a characteristic of uh yes so basically, if the red light is on, so that means the signal is sent out from this transmission line. And if we want to measure something like, uh, so you guys are okay with the open circuits, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, thank you for doing this, by the way. Yeah, sure. This means a lot to us, uh, especially after the snow, uh, snow, snow in 2020 here. So. 
yeah, if you guys check this one, it's have all the like, uh, loads. Yeah, short. I recognize some of them. All the terminators. Is that 50 ohm? Uh, that's a short. Okay, short. Sure. Ooh, interesting. Hold on a second. I'm going to zoom in on that while you're doing it. That's kind of cool. Do my repeat. No, no. <laughs> okay. So, this you can see because of the late deform reflection coefficient, it just jumps back because that's always the total voltage from the like, input and the reflection. And, so that, and, and that sharp decline there is the short, and then the rise is the 0.25 um, output signal. Right. 250 millivolts. Or 25 millivolts, whatever this. Um, actually, you can. So if I move the cursor to here, it's 630. And the, you got to move a secondary line up there. There you go. Basically, just you see the difference. The What's end. the potential there? 500 millivolts? It's 570 millivolts here. Okay. And uh, 620 millivolts here. So it's, oh, eight. Yeah, so it's about 250 millivolts. Yeah. So. That's uh, short. So that's just a coax cable, and you're shorting the, the center to the ground? Right, the conductor. Yep. Yes, and, me. Mm -hmm. and that tabletop, that, like when it's up there, that's like twice the distance because it's reflecting. Is that correct? Oh, uh, which one? So what is the duration of this? Is that twice the length of the... Oh, I think it probably just like the time. Because it's time delay. Yeah. Probably just a time take yeah. to get here and go back. Okay. And if we use a matched impedance, like the figures, so you guys know how to like check whether it's male or female. Right? So just make sure to connect them correct or it will be damaged. This, I don't think this one is perfect. Some have been used probably more than others, yeah. Because it's all males for those videos. <laughs> and that's the only one. I'm not sure. Actually, I can try this first and I can try something else. Hmm. So each channel can source oh. and receive? Uh, yes. So basically, this one actually. And the, you see, I put the 50 ohm here, and this thing's matched. Yeah. And the, not the correct value. Yeah. I think that's, that's it for the. That's what I mean. You can just click this one and you to set different things. Uh, what are like the menus that we should be most familiar with? Like in here? Yeah. Like probably just set the voltage right and set the to this point like here. Yeah. Probably just adjust those voltages and then use this and because all you have to do is like to uh, segment and the, oh actually there's Oh, right. You need to know how to save everything in case I have oh, yeah. yeah. somewhere. That's why I said, what did I have? I can't live on this one. Yeah. Yeah. See you last night. I'm not sure where the process is.
Did it say something about floppy disks? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's why the data is is the way it is, isn't it? Is that why it's like one horizontal line versus vertically? Because yeah. it's from the floppy. Yeah. Wow. You talking about the Excel? Yeah, that yeah. drove me nuts. And actually, like, I used a weird version of Excel, and it was like didn't give me the last couple of values. So I had to do a trick. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Oh, Parnas explores the way from the file. Yeah. And the, yeah. If you have the floppy. You can just explore that. Hey, don't bash on floppy, man. Our nukes still run on floppy disk. So, yeah, but <laughs> so that's the good reason. So if, if we took this waveform, which is the stem response, that's the open. Yeah, it is the stem response of this cable. And if we took the derivative, we would get the impulse response, right? If we take the derivative of this one, we'll get what? Impulse response. Oh, uh, yeah. And then if we took the Fourier transform that we would get the same plot we saw earlier with the uh, dips that signify like every, 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 yeah. every uh, half wavelength you get the dip in S11, right? You'd see the same thing if you if you took the derivative and then the Fourier transform of this waveform, right? Mm. I'm not sure. Okay. But I can check check back to your question. Is that all your loss? Like is that the same thing with the, yeah, because, because I, so the like, uh, yeah. simulation data he showed us with the frequency response of the S11 and the S21, yeah. it should be the same information as the time response, right? I think so, yeah. I think so, but I'll double check it. This is in room 419, right? This is this, this, this equipment. Uh, yes, yeah. you have the password for the group, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's on the same so 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 Cool. And then once you get it on the floppy, you just plug it into the computer. And there you go. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I think there's. How do you export anything from floppy disk? You have to have an old computer. Or you have to go to um, go to PC, uh, re PC, the location and setup. Uh, you you yeah, can yeah. get like. Floppy readers and just buy peripheral converter it can convert it like USB. Yeah, I need a USB uh, to floppy disk converter. If you want any old PC parts, <laughs> great PC. Yeah, we can sell it on Amazon. One type of as well. You have like two people by direction. I'm not hovering, sorry. I am hovering. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. Can you tell me what the orange buttons are? What are this one? Just the ones that are lit. This one? He's talking yeah. here. No. Oh, oh, basically the channel. You just, oh, okay. It's yeah, just selected. Yeah. Okay. And you can expand the channels because there, there are those slots down there. Yeah. Yeah. So I can hear at channels. Oh, this one. I think, well, according to Professor Kudos, he's saying those party like something uh, like this. Okay. It's, so it's the most expensive part for this whole thing. Like, like expanders and for, for other yeah. capability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Maybe we can play with some math functions in the scope? Yeah. I mean, if you want, you can just uh, try it. You can try it with the. Oh, actually, we can get to it. So, so our, next, so our next, <laughs> next slides will have to take our own data, then I'm guessing. Oh, you don't need to. No. Nope. Um, Never? <laughs> no. Really? No, no. It, it's, just, it's only there to serve as, like, for the purpose. Yeah, if you understand. Yeah. Or what's going on? Okay. Is, the data will always be uploaded. Okay. Yeah. I was nice. surprised. Yeah, I, I would, I would <laughs> caution. Because then you have to worry about floppy disk. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, true. But I'll caution this just from our electromagnetics, which is the hardest class that he teaches from right. last semester, radar. Uh, wait a little, a few days after he posts the data. Because many times what, what ends up happening is the time domain data is not there. Oh, yeah. Or, or, or there's another aspect of it that's not there, which sometimes he doesn't know until so here we, got we go through it. Yeah, sure. So what so I do, what we, we the first one. Let someone else test it out. <laughs> I felt like that was me. I was asking, uh, do you go by Scott or do you go by uh, Scott? Okay. I was asking Scott because like, I got my time domain wrong, and I was like, I'm pretty sure he said 50 nanoseconds, and it was something else. So, yeah. Yeah, I saw, I saw some of the files he, when he plotted in Excel because the Excel That's data doesn't technically yeah. oh. have, you have to manually associate the time data when you go plot it. 
and his access label is incorrect. So I yeah. went back and looked at like, oh no, that's not right. Yeah. yeah. And so I caught it before it did anything. But I imagine other people did not catch it. Exactly. So yeah, for the time they uh, did you see like there's a file, it's called not to use this, like you can yeah, 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 file yeah, file so they <laughs> use this one. Yeah. No, even to use one. But then I was confused. One or two <laughs> Yeah, because uh, like the name of the file was like 260 pico. You told me it's 2.6 yeah. nano. Yeah, that's the nano second. That's the Yeah, so that that's why my answers were all wrong. So I wish you took any of the labels with the green small impression. I mean, that's the that, that's the lesson learned. So now I know. Just check again. If I'm off by a magnitude of 10, that's probably why. Even um, more so, I mainly put the type yeah. renders into my MATLAB script just so I wasn't going to accidentally get the wrong. Yeah, exactly. But the, but the data points I just extracted, I wasn't going to go. Last question we did, because it was so dip challenging in certain aspects, we, we had like a group uh, focus on it as a cohort because uh, it was, some of the stuff was fairly complex. We were doing like SAR analysis with apertures and multiple antennas and imaging B52s and that stuff got me, man. That, that distortion matrix stuff on the home yeah. was lab three? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. I don't think it has it. Actually, I, I actually did find the lab three. I, think. You did? I, I was able to figure it out. It was just the SAR? Yeah. SAR and SAR. I did set up the Slack last class I took. We should set one up in here, man. No, no that's, what, that's what I did. You did? I, s I sent a link. Yes. Uh, I hadn't yes. used it before last quarter, and okay. then someone in that class, but it's then in the class. It's a Nagel class. So I'm set it up because I'd never used it before, like, and I was trying to use um, Canvas as terrible. And then I set up, and like, yeah. this is amazing. It's really bad. Yeah, Canvas is. But it's like, no, Slack is, like, comparatively really, really good. Oh, and so the discussion boards you're saying? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I wish our company would use it, but they love Microsoft products, unfortunately. Yes. Well, it's helpful. I mean, instead of you know overwhelming him with questions, you can bounce stuff off each other, and I've always found that pretty helpful. Uh, well, it's got to learn to learn, to learn more stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What is what's the uh, other signal you added? Oh, it's the derivative of. The, it's you know, there's a math yeah. math function. Yeah, I had the derivative, and then I was hoping to um, see if we could take the Fourier. Yeah, and then get the same thing as a simulation, but there's not a FFT on this instance. No, no, no way. Well, m a lot of m new scopes have FFTs in them. Right, the new ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I had some floppy. Right away. I've used the <laughs> one. I've been fortunate. In it. All right, cool. Was there anything else? Uh, <laughs> gotta eat. Oh, that's USB Type A. Oh, actually, oh, you don't need to use the uh, lobby disk. Actually, there's a. Uh, yeah, I, I was USB. able to. I was able to. Oh, use it. oh yeah. Uh, this one, there's a USB disk. Oh, but the other one only has a. The one upstairs? Yes, yeah, one upstairs. Oh, so, so there's one not from upstairs. Uh, it is, but he has two. So. Oh, okay. Do we have a choice to use this one? I'm sure. You, can use to, you just have to fight we'll someone. We'll just steal out. that thing. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I'm sure. No problem. Oh. Sorry, guys. I'll be right back. Two seconds. I, I had a question about, um, you know, like those unknown devices. Yeah. You know, you know what's actually in the in that thing or not? What do we mean? Like, it's like. You know, like the material that's in there, or oh, um, I don't know. Well, it's not even that one. You mean like it's not yeah, the material? Yeah. Like, so, I don't know if you know. I'm not just the same. No, I thought it was maybe like yeah, something. <laughs> yeah, so you actually don't even need the voltage there because all you need is. Um, yeah, you don't even need the voltage, you just need to be piece of high. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I have it. Uh, yeah, so if I just use this equation, it gave us this three from the um, test, you can get the four circuits in the end. This is, yeah, these are 
iterations. One, two, three, um, five, I know this voltage, I know this voltage, I know this is T equals zero. I can solve that. And, and uh, I know if we're the one that's used for this one later on, you can choose to know that uh, your, uh, your, R, your R is basically that's the trick. Okay. So then once you know that, then you can say this that value here is equal to this basically. Um the only thing that helps that helps you with is if it helps you solve for R really quickly. But you have to be careful, you can't just pick a parameter that's out there because if you do, that will fit a lot of our solution, or you're more likely to fit our solution. If you want to fit you want to pick something closer, then that's kind of the that's kind of the tricky part. Um, so that's the third one I think, right? That looks like it's um, yeah, really fast. Yeah, so I actually did um, the I, I actually did two different methods. One was the trap method, and then two was using um, the theoretical piece of art, and then the other piece of art. Yeah, um, I have an idea. And I'll basically I found that um, if you use the um, so are you still recording this? Good. Are you still recording? Oh, so I just want to add one. Uh, go ahead. So basically, um, as I said, like here, if this one is turned on, and if this one is turned on, so we'll go back here. So basically, as the way you turn it, I mean, it's like you go to the menu and just click the TDR. And if you can use the channel one, oh, you're basically just latching that on. And okay. I just, if you're here, you see. Oh, it switches over to that channel. Cool. Yeah, just make sure it's right. Oh, I got it. It's right on it. You can, they can see your hands. If, if they're both outputting, if you put them together, would you see, I guess, no, because it's shielded? It is shielded, yeah. So you wouldn't see any industrial You would see it from the movement. Yeah, you, yeah. you wouldn't see anything coupling yeah. or anything like that. Yeah, I think that's the only thing I'll just say. Cool, man. Thank you, sir. All right. Is there, uh, can I ask you, um, is there a way you could set the pulse or no? Set the pulse? Yeah, like how fast? Can we try to scale?